Phoenix here, guys, and welcome to this pre-interest rate announcement. Are you excited? Are you excited? Put that you are excited in the chat. I'm certainly excited. We run through a little bit here in advance, A, your questions, and B, what the expectations are and what that therefore means. And it also gives me a chance to uh, to just set up <laughs> the, the, the Fed live stream here as well. So let me share my screen with you guys. Of course, none of the following is financial advice. You know that by now, right? It's just, you know, a guy on YouTube with his opinions, and you are smart enough to think through that. So let me just open up the um, uh, the uh, live stream here, make sure we're set up properly. Today is, this is it, press conference. Where's the link? All right, let me find it. I'll find the link. Um, in the meantime, I'll leave you with <laughs> a little bit of excitement here. A lot of tech, a lot of China rallying, quite nice today, right? But the SPY down 0.4% at the moment, S&P. I've got a trade on that, so I'm looking at that on another screen. Um, let me just look up our live stream, make sure we are... Um, you know, we're going gonna to catch the, uh, the what live, which is the key thing that we're here for. Uh, so what am I here for, actually? Well, I'm expecting, quite frankly, for that... I just don't think it's going to come in any other way. But what I am looking for is some hawkishness in terms of language from Jay Powell. And I'm not alone on that. Basically, all of Wall Street seems to think pretty much the same thing. The question is just how tough is he going to go in terms of tough language, right? If you remember his Jackson Hole speech, that was like eight minutes and it tanked the market pretty uh, successfully for quite a significant period of time. Uh, so if you were him and you were looking at this here, let me show it to you. What's the right chart? This, I showed you a different version of this yesterday, but this is uh, Bloomberg who made this. What have you got? You got in red the federal funds rate. So that's essentially the interest rate, right? Sitting at four and a half percentage points or, or thereabouts. Uh, that's the Fed. And then you've got the financial conditions. And you would expect them to be in, 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 in step. They should be like dancing partners happily together, but they're not. Uh, what we've got here is the financial conditions, financial conditions, and they are massively, massively lower, right? So how do you explain that? Does that make any sense? Should we be falling from here to that? I don't think we should be. It doesn't really make any sense. Interest rates are super high and we are undoing the work of the Fed, therefore tempting the Fed to do more. It's a dangerous thing. Don't really bet against, against um, the Fed. Generally speaking, I don't advise it. Um, our head coach, who's an investment banker for 20 years, he said he remembers doing it once in the 90s. He's never done it again. The lone wolf, why is Felix not trending? Well, probably because you have, haven't smashed the like button sufficiently hard, right? That would probably be the explanation. So there's, there's one thing you can do. But yeah, let me run you through a little bit of like the setup here, what I look, what I see. Uh, Goldman's um, giving us a nice miserable summary here in terms of CTAs. What are CTAs? The algo funds, right? And they've been supportive of this rally, what I would call a squeeze this year. And let me get a pen. Microsoft, maybe we have a pen, apparently, yes. So one month demand to the upside has fallen to just 27 billion. It was 42. So a week ago, they were going to buy 42 billion if the market moved up right, of, of the S&P. Now, if the market trends lowers, they are going to sell 191 billion for the month. So these, 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 Funds essentially work on technical analysis. So they, the market goes down, they sell. But that's a whopping amount. And if you if you look at that as a, as a proportion, right, 27 billion if we go up versus 191 billion if we go down, where do you think the risk is? <laughs> so the upside or the downside, right? Well, um, my trades are set, certainly at the moment have some, it would have, we'd have some very, very big benefit if we move down over the next couple of weeks or so. Um, JP Morgan also uh, illuminating us with some, some happiness. Positioning is similar to August 2020, which preceded the 17% decline in the S&P. And this was what it was. We had a lovely rally up. We went up, you know, I don't know what, 20%. And then we topped out here 
we were overbought and we came back down 70 percentage points. So possible that Jay Powell wants to do that. Yeah, um, we can skip past that one a little bit here. But yeah, I just I showed you this this morning just to show you that in the post dot com crash, we had all these rallies with all these months, the ones that are pointing upwards that were glorious. But the white line was the, the, the Nasdaq. So it continued to fall despite these mini rallies. So that's personally my view on it. I hope I'm going to be proven wrong because I also enjoy an up market like you do. But yeah, this financial conditions, they are super low. We're basically at interest rates of 2% according to the market. And the Fed wants it to be 5, 5 5.1, something like that. So there is a disparity there. And I think he's going to have to address that today if he wants us to take him seriously. So volatility also super low, which also doesn't really make sense. Um, so that could also be pick, picked up significantly here. And momentum, again, very rare you get more than sort of three months in a row of positive momentum. So we've had, um, you know, positive momentum here now um, for three months, basically. And that doesn't happen very often, right? Remember 2021? And remember what happened there at the top, right? It all came crashing down. You remember 2017, 18, it came crashing down. 2008, 9, it came crashing down and so on. So generally speaking, very long periods of positive momentum. Unless the underlying, unless the economy is really doing really fantastically well, doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit bearish. And please tell me off. I might be wrong on that. But I continue to make money on it. So not on direction, but literally just on earnings trades. Uh, we have... Um, Actually, I only have one earnings trade open today. I'll probably do some more live trading after today. And of course, I'll stream that to you guys in the uh, uh, coaching and, 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 and community. So check it out. The first 12 trades that we did of the year in terms of earnings, we made a 12% return um, over 10 days, which isn't too bad, right? So you can figure that out uh, if you buy on your own if you want. I did. It took me a few years. cost me a few hundred thousand dollars. Or you can come and learn it from us if you're so inclined. Um, if you have five-figure plus portfolio cash, whatever then check out felixfrentz.org slash coaching and um, just have a call with us. Just We'll walk you through it. Uh, this is the other thing that makes me feel a little bit squeezy is, is the greed indicator. We are at almost extreme greed. Again, not necessarily the greatest time uh, to buy. But Goldman explained, and I'll run you through this quickly this morning, so I'll do it very briefly, and then I'll take your questions, guys. Um, old chunk of coal, you're with me on the bearishness. Look, I'm if he isn't hawkish today, again, we could get we will get a, get a really nice squeeze up. So, But I, I, I'm kind of short term not quite sure medium term a couple of months out i'm fairly bearish and then long run i'm always bullish because in the long run stuff goes up um you know how many people it took to produce a million dollar of revenue in the s p 500 companies on average like 20 years ago seven people how many people do we need now to create a million dollars of revenue two people so that makes companies more valuable, it means they can generate more revenue per input cost. And that's why stock prices have gone up and money printing. That helps a lot as well. But yeah, essentially, Goldman's are saying, look, there's a few things that are pointing in the right direction. Wage growth has been uh, encouraging uh, wage growth inflation. Um, average hourly earnings have come down a little bit. Rent inflation is looking a little bit better. There are some recession fears out there. So, you know, uncertainty in the near-term outlook has risen and that's kind of encouraging and that's why we are likely to get that quarter percent hike not a half point hike although if he really wants to like you know us then um he's going to give us a half point but i very much doubt it because i think he's he's more worried about doing too much and he knows he's got all that money shredding still going so if i were him i would bang on a lot about the money shredding and just how much money they're going to shred this year and next year and the year after and kind of scare markets a little bit with that without having to change his tune really on interest rates all that much because i'm not sure we're going to believe it uh, if you are not yet part of our um if you're not yet part of our someone's calling me <laughs> um newsletter um, it's not just any old newsletter we give you trade traits that we do these are like unique special opportunities that we we we, we aim for and, and aim to find um this one we think is going to come down about 70 percent and we set up an options trade where you can basically put 145 dollars into it that's your maximum risk you can't lose any more than that and your potential gain is eight eight times upside and we've outlined exactly that trade we can actually give you a few ways of you could you could do that uh, that trade i'm not giving you financial advice i'm not telling you you should do it but um even from a learning experience i think it's quite useful uh, if you want to learn how that works um and by the way our last trade was a tesla trade which made 550 percent in three days uh, that we we recommended um 
go to felixschwanz.org slash trade links also in the description and you can sign up there's a seven day free trial so it's literally zero risk um there is a monthly or a yearly if you join it for the monthly it's 87 bucks if you join it for the yearly it's 30 percent cheaper um and just you know get your hands on those trades uh, see if you think the content is worthwhile and, and you know you might want to stay with us um, it's a fabulous community. We're also going to add um, a private chat community to that very, very shortly. So again, you guys looking for great trade ideas, um, that's going to be the place to go. So links down below, felixfriends.org slash trade. Uh, this is the chart of the day, essentially, and it's about as messy as it gets, right? So what have I, what have I done instead? Well, let me make this a little smaller. So down here in the bottom right, I've got, and I'm going to have to rejig some some banners here, right? We've got far too many banners open. I'm going to move these around a little bit. I think that'll probably work a little better. Um, I've got the QQQ. So we have a core wall resistance at 300. And that means if you break through 300, the hedging flow kicks in and it pushes the market down. It makes it harder to get through 300. And then we have um, at 280, the put wall, same story, but it supports us. If you hit, hit 280, you're more likely to bounce up because again, the market makers start buying to unwind their trade positions to cover their backside. And then at 291, you've got something what we call a volatility trigger. So basically above 291, where we are right now, you know, the waves are calm, everybody's happy. And when we drop below 291, gale force winds start to pick up just a little bit. So I'm gonna leave this up here and we're gonna see exactly what happens at, um, First of all, at, at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is this, let me make that a different color. This dotted line here is 2 p.m. Uh, and then at 2.30 when the Fed, when he actually starts speaking, that's gonna make a difference. And I'm just gonna reject my lights here, guys. Give me one sec. I think that's a little bit better, isn't it? A little bit bright now, perhaps, but better bright than too dark, I, I, I always think. So, guys, any questions? This is the chance to ask them because I won't be interrupting when Jay Powell speaks and so on. Um, Robert Roth, I can't sell everything and hope to rebuy lower again. I'm tired. Um, no, don't do that. That's a really bad idea, Robert. Sorry, the, the transaction costs and so on are going to be pretty bad. Um, hedging is one thing you could do. And actually, funnily enough, we did a whole email just about half an hour ago on all the ways you could hedge today with a really, really low cost. Like you can hedge a $40,000 portfolio for about 100 bucks, which means you have zero exposure to the downside for today. Uh, that's a good thing to do if you understand how to do that. So again, that's felixfriends.org slash trade if you want to learn how to do that. Um, do you have a 2002 recession financial conditions versus interest rate chart like you showed now? Mm. Galtona, um, financial conditions and interest rates are relatively easy, but um, and recession, yeah, probably. We could, we could uh, pull that up. Here's a new chart. So we can go and look at, um, what do you want to look at? What was it again? Financial conditions, interest rates. So interest rates, it sets interest rates and then it's going to be monthly let's get rid of the fibs here and then we compare that to we also don't need that and then we compare that to uh financial conditions agro fed financial conditions i don't know how back long far back that data goes but look at here's 2002 so financial conditions in 2000 and so 2002 we had a lot of rate cuts and then they picked up from 2004 maybe that's what you're referring to right they picked up and then the um okay the scales are a bit off obviously but financial conditions really really freaking tightened right into 2008 that was the financial crisis and that's essentially what what kicked that off is that all that rate increases kicked off the financial crisis um and 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 you know I mean, that's what we're hoping what we're hoping for here but you know that's that's what it, what it looks like then so there we go there is your chart why are rate increases always multiples of 0 0.25 great question i don't think it's just easy isn't it maybe fed presidents can only divide and multiply by four that's, that's a possibility isn't it what do you think about the jobs data from today yeah let's have a look at that that's a that's a good one to look at so economic calendar here it is so let's take a quick screenshot of this before, what have we got? We've got we've got 10 minutes, so we can run through this a little bit. 
So let's just uh, take it all. There we go. Oh yeah, I had a few more charts actually. Volatility could spike. I also have a trade open on volatility, which again, eight eight x uh, potential upside. You pay twelve bucks, and potentially you get a hundred bucks sort of thing. Uh, so that's a not a bad bad setup sometimes. So job openings are at eleven million. Um, so they are larger than expected. So from a so from investor point of view that's bad because the fed wants there to be less job openings very 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 distinctly we've got more job job openings that's not a good thing uh, the job quits number you want that to go down a lot because people don't quit their job when the economy collapses and they're worried about finding a new job so that's come down a little bit so that's a, a positive sorry my red line there that was a that was just try, trying to mess with your mind here. That's a negative. It's a red positive. Uh, crikey. It's like a COVID test or something, isn't it? Uh, construction spending is coming down. That's probably a positive because that's sort of, you know, recession belts. But in reality, that was probably extreme weather rather than anything else. ISM manufacturing orders are coming down again. Is that positive? Well, from a Fed point of view, yes, but it also screams recession. That's like the fifth or sixth month that's coming down. So that. Generally speaking, we get a recession if you get five months of decline. Um, and manufacturing employment coming down a little bit as well. So there, there is there is some good news in here. Manufacturing prices, however, that's really bad news because that's majorly, majorly inflationary, right? 44.5, 39 last month, way higher than expected. So there is still more inflation. There's still more jobs open. And, um, you know, Jay Powell probably choked on his lunch slightly as he was reading that or sorry 10 a.m which is probably the first cherry of the day uh, so yeah not what the fed wants in terms of data here today definitely not so i don't think that the big ones to me is the job opening data here and in the manufacturing crisis as well uh, simon you got all your options before fair for mc and that's a good thing to do um the other thing you could always do is essentially aim for a delta zero portfolio so you basically have no risk either way it goes my delta is six, so it's, it's not, not not too bad. So if it goes up, it goes down. Like basically, I I, I, I I'm pretty much e equally positioned. Um, Nev, the market's more looking at recession fear. Well, the market seems to be thinking that there isn't is going to be this this mythical soft landing, like a one of those SpaceX rockets that just very very gently comes down to Earth. And I don't believe it, to be honest with you. I don't think. The Fed's ever achieved that, and I don't think they're likely to achieve it right now. Isn't less quits positive for the Fed? Yes. Hence the hence the green green plus. The, the green plus means positive. Smart liner, you're quite right. Who's going to call official re recession, Andrea? Well, there are like you know twelve old wise men in Washington who call that in the U.S. You might be thinking I'm kidding, but I'm not, and that's the way you do it in the U.S. There isn't a a every other country in the world says two quarters of negative GDP growth or you know, GDP decline, it's a recession. The US is like, yes, but why don't we ask the wise men? And the wise men will say yes or no. Um, yeah, that's the way it works. Bunch of old economists, old central bankers and that sort of thing. So they are basically uh, deciding this. Uh, Anthony, brilliant question. All right, let me, let me outline this. What, what happens uh, depending on what Jay Powell says? So you have, let me get a slightly less horrific color, blue. So we have two outcomes here, right? Jay Powell is um, hawkish in language, which basically means, you know, we are going to do whatever we must and we must do more. And, you know, we're going to, going to shred loads more money. And, you know, we are, we're going to keep rates high for super long and potentially we're going to raise them significantly higher than 5% if needed. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm seriously concerned about the inflation numbers. The job opening data today is horrific and um, the market, the financial conditions easing is a terrible thing. He comes out saying stuff like that. What happens? Um, you would expect about sort of minus 2% drop in um, in the market, right? That, roughly something like that. If that's sort of option number one. Option number two is JP says, 
same as usual. So no particular change in language, just basically says we will do what we must and, you know, we will get inflation back down to its 2% uh, long-term target, uh, but doesn't say anything else, then I would say we probably get about a plus 2% um, in markets. And then you've got outliers, right? You've got outliers. Say they raise rates by 0.5% you get hit over the head really, really quickly. The market's going to significantly tank. I very much doubt he's going to do that. So I think we're kind of like more in this sort of sort of sphere here, a couple of percents up and down uh, from, from today. Uh, the market is a little worried about it. We're down half a percentage point. So you're going to got a little bit of that priced in there already. Um, but the Canoy gate today wasn't, wasn't brilliant. If they do come in hawkish, the sort of Jackson Hole type language where he was pretty tough on us as a financial market and he's basically saying, you know, exuberance in financial markets are not really justified sort of thing, then um, we might come down a bit because, as I said at the beginning, the CTAs, the algorithm funds, are going to chase a falling market. They're going to sell into it and they're going to sell $191 billion if the market takes a downturn, significant one, right? So that's kind of the downside risk here. I'd see it as greater than the upside risk at the moment. Uh, Elon, how do growth companies survive looming recession, interest rates stay higher? Well, some of them won't, which is why, you know, we publish quarterly a list of zombie companies. So, so you can look at who doesn't have enough money or profits or cash flow to, um, to survive. So look at if you hold growth companies, look at how much cash they've got. If they haven't got cash for, you know, quite a few quarters, then you might want to think about why you're holding that. Um, what's your favorite color of tie? Now, there's some theory that if he wears a particular color tie, he's in a particular mood. He will say data dependent. Yeah, if he just says data dependent, that's sort of that's probably fairly good news. Peculiar handwriting. I know, I know, Andrea. Um, you can probably psychoanalyze that. Carmen said, "Buy the dip." Who's Carmen? Uh, Barry says, "Sell." Oh, Kramer. Okay, Kramer. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm worried. Um, Anthony, absolute pleasure. Feel free to ask like literally any question um, you, you, you want here. That's the whole point. We have six minutes till this ship goes live um, because that's when the Fed really is going to give us the interest rate decision and a statement. Now, the real juice comes not in the statement or the interest rate, but it comes in the live press conference afterwards. And we've even had it that you know the market rallied during the press conference. Some idiotic reporter told him, and then he got out his hammer and he you know hammered down on us a little hard. Uh, so stuff can happen during that. Six minutes until the ship sinks, indeed. Um, so the way I'm looking at this is that you know we're pretty overboard. We've got this massive separation between financial conditions and the Fed interest rate, which the Fed is going to absolutely hate, and. Um, I would expect him to throw out some pretty, pretty tough language at us. But let's see, right? That's what, we, what we're waiting here for. Usually in the statement, there isn't a lot. It's, it's all in the 30 minutes afterwards. Um, that's really what we want to look for. If you are interested in getting some trade alerts from us, uh, so we put out a trade yesterday, which of course you still get if you sign up, uh, where we think a stock is going to go down 70% because of all sorts of shenanigans. You can set up a trade with a $145 risk. That's the maximum you could ever possibly lose. And then you could make an 8% return on that if it goes in the direction that we, we would expect it to. Uh, no guarantees, obviously. I'm not a financial advisor, although I'm not sure they give you guarantees either. Uh, but uh, you know, the last trade we recommended was 550% up. That was a Tesla trade in three days. Um, and we send out another email just actually with how to hedge this particular event. And we'll have obviously lots more outlier trade ideas coming up. And these are the trades that I actually do as well. I, I actually I did that trade uh, yesterday. So check it out. If you want to check that out and get your hands on it, there's a seven day free trial at felixfriends.org slash trade. Links also down below in the description. Uh, it's 87 bucks a month. If you join for the year, it's 31% cheaper. And as I said, it's a seven day free trial. So you could literally after day six say, Felix, this sucked and I'm walking away. Or you can say, this was absolutely brilliant. Thanks for sharing. Um, who writes it? My head coach. He's been an investment banker for 20 years. He manages millions and millions of money for funds, invests, of course, himself. He's worked at major and major investment banks. He's worked on major stock exchanges as a market maker. Um, and we discuss basically the ideas every single morning. We have great fun doing that. Great fun setting the trades up ourselves. And we look at like what are the best ways to set them up with the lowest risk and the highest return. And um, I like these kind of setups. 
put on $145. I, I did a bit more than that, but that's what you could do. And then, you know, you could back, get back a thousand or something like that um, if it works out the way we expect it to. So these are, these are pretty interesting trades. Uh, and that's exactly what we do. So sign up for that, guys, if you want. It's a free trial, as I say. Um, now, we have three minutes left. So we're feeling a little bit anxious. We're feeling a little bit nervous. And uh, the data is about to hit us in the face. And I'm going to get make some space for it to get ready. And um, we're going to look at this page here. There will be a press release on this Fed page here uh, to give us that. And obviously, Bloomberg's going to give us the thing up there as well. I've got the QQQ open down here on the right. Why? Because the QQQ or the NASDAQ ETF is the most rate sensitive beast we have. And we would expect to see something here on the minute chart that's going to give us a pretty quick reaction. Now, the initial reaction is often wrong, by the way, which makes us even more fun. What would the VIX play have been? Um, depth wish that we did a trade on the UVXI. Um, and I've got that trade open. I'm looking at it, which is essentially a bet on rising volatility. It's super cheap. Um, it's It was, how much was that trade? Hundred dollars for a potentially, you know, unlimited upside. So, yeah, be interesting to see what happens here in the next few minutes. Um, either I make some money or I lose a defined amount of money on trades, which is what I'm happy with. Um, now, guys, if you were terribly kind, you'd smash the like button because it would maybe draw in slightly more than a thousand people. And I appreciate you all tuning in. Uh, we look forward to. Um, Looking at the numbers, and then half an hour later, we get Fed Chair Powell speaking live at a press conference, giving a statement, getting interviewed by all the major financial media. And that's really the exciting bit. And I'll walk you through, I'll, 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 dry, I'll write out and I'll type out, because you can't read my handwriting, you know, former lawyer here with a terrible handwriting. Uh, and I'll give you my, my summary and thoughts of like what it actually means and what he said before. Um, Anthony. I'm not a fan of shorting. Um, I think you can set up a trade that is a much, much, that has sort of a one to eight ratio um, before the event. And that's probably the time to do it um, rather than shorting the market. Um, we want to see blood, says Alex. 10 seconds. Uh, let's see what we get here. Bloomberg's undoubtedly going to get put it out there probably before I hit the refresh button for the 10th time and get frustrated that they put it out on the website too long. Um, has there been a leak? No, no leak, no leak. Uh, leaks would be fairly criminal. There really shouldn't be any leaks. The market hasn't moved yet. You can see that here. I'm going to remove that line because it's going to block the minute you want to see, but you can see where we are, right? So I'm hitting the refresh button frantically. It still isn't out. It still isn't out. No, it still isn't out. Um, Germany and the Netherlands are merging their armies. That's an interesting point of view from a historical perspective, isn't it? Right. What? Well, where is it? Where is it? Where is the rate cut decision or the rate increase decision rather? Okay. Market going down a little bit here, but we still haven't got it. Bloomberg hasn't got it. We haven't got it. Has anybody got it? Yeah, we've got it. Um, yeah, quarter percent increase, guys. Quarter percent increase. Bloomberg seems to be late to the party here. A quarter percent has popped up here in the bottom right of my, my trading economics update. Uh, we're waiting for the statement. Uh, where is the bleeding statement, guys? Why isn't it here? It should be here, but it isn't. Uh, so we got a 25% basis point increases, which was precisely what we expected. So that is not news, really. That's precisely what we wanted. Um, and um, but let me look at why haven't we got um, why haven't we got the announcement for the actual piece of paper out yet? So quarter percent interest rate is 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 definitely confirmed. Um, but 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 there should be a statement um, which they haven't uploaded yet. Lazy people, why haven't they uploaded it? Um, might have to look on Reuters. That might be quicker. No, they haven't done it yet either. Well, we'll do it quicker than will be. Bloomberg, analysis of interest decision in real time. Bloomberg, see if they're quicker. That's a pretty glum picture of him, isn't it? Um, open market committee, one Feb attached. Uh, we are subscribers, you muppets. Um, 
Okay, okay, okay. Let's find it. Let's find it. Yeah. Quarter. Fed repeats ongoing rate increases will be appropriate, says Bloomberg. And why isn't this thing out yet? Why isn't this thing out yet? Recent postings. Here we go. Okay. They put it on the wrong page. Recent indicators point to modest growth in spending and production. Um, I'm going to color code this like a six year old. That's good. Uh, job gains have been robust in recent months and unemployment rate has remained low. That's bad. Inflation has eased somewhat. That's sort of positive, but remains elevated. That's not good. Russia's war against Ukraine is causing tremendous human economic hardship, is contributing to elevated global uncertainty. The committee is highly attentive to inflation risk. Okay, that's the same language as usual. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment inflation at the rate of 2% over the longer run. In support of these goals, the committee has decided to raise the rates by a quarter of a percentage point. The committee anticipates that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate uh, to attain a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restricted to return to inflation to the 2% target. I could probably say that out without the text here by now. In determining the extent of future increases, note plural, in the target range, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy. We like that. That in English means we've done a lot and we're going to want to see what all the stuff that we've done, all the rate hikes together, what that is going to do as a knockoff effect. Our markets have come down a little here, but not a great deal so far. Um, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and economic inflation. Um, so lag, this is all good. This is basically talking about lags. We want that. In addition, the committee will continue reducing its holdings of treasuries. This is money shredding. As described in previous plans, the committee is strongly committed to returning inflation to 6% objective. That's always the same. In assessing the appropriate stance of monetary policy, the committee will continue to monitor the implications of incoming information. The committee will be prepared to adjust the stance as appropriate if risks emerge that could impede the attainment of the committee's goals. Um, it will take into account a wide range of information and, you know, blah, de, blah, de, blah. So nothing particularly unusual in this. SPY down a little bit, 0.7% down now, but kind of not pretty unfaced by it. Volatility pretty much flat. Nothing really happening here uh, so far. So my bearish trade on the SPY is so far printing a $70 profit, which isn't quite what we wanted. Um, but let's see. Let's see what the man comes out with later. That's really what moves the market here. So, so far, no huge, not a huge impact from this. And if you look at the red and green, there's a bit of green in this. Now, do you have questions on this? Does the statement make sense to you? Does the language make sense to you? If not, pop a question here in the, in the live chat. That's why we are doing it. Why do you use red as the color for danger, Danzo? Well, it's in the Western world, sort of universally the color for danger, isn't it? Stop signs are red, that sort of thing. What do you want me to do? Blue or yellow or something? Um, Numb to the rhetoric, um, says MDM. Money shredding and not QE is not going to help stocks. I agree with you that on that. But so far, the market seems relatively unfazed by this. Like we literally moved down not a lot. You can see that down here on the on the little chart. I'll make it a little bit more dramatic. Uh, and now we're climbing back up. So the bankers have just read it and they're like, well, that doesn't mean a lot. We're back to where we started. So um, we're exactly where we started pretty much now before this data came out. But give it a few minutes. Bankers are not the quickest creatures. They need to, need to have this explained to them so they know what it means. But no, so far, this is basically what we expected. No real nasty language in here. Other than that, job gains have been robust in recent months. That's kind of the that's what they're leading with here. So let's see what, what that says. Something written about the terminal rate. Um, no, not so far. Um, not so far. So we get the minutes of these meetings like a lot later, right? We don't get them today. We get them in a couple of weeks. Uh, that's for some reason the way it works. Uh, when is he speaking? He's going to be speaking in 25 minutes. So it's time to make yourself a cup of hot cocoa and uh, and come back and leave us on here. Uh, come on, Powell, Jackson Hole, the market, says Christy. I take it, Christy, you have a bearish trade open uh, like, like I do, um, which at the moment is losing me $5, which is which is all right. I can live with that. Any changes in the terminal rates? Um, no, nope, not mentioned. Bear or bull today? At the moment, very, very much undecided. But Jay Powell speaking tends to have a significant impact. So far, the statement hasn't. Um, Elon Tusk, who inf created the inflation? The idiot who printed 40% extra US dollars in two years. That's the guy who created the inflation. Who was that again? Who was that again? Was it Jay Powell? 
How many times do we want to hear lag today? We'd like him to mention lag at least three times, I'd say, Andrea. It's only in the statement here once, but um, it's it's kind of a big piece of it. Time to buy S&P puts, uh, you say. Um, tr my personal opinion is it will pause for the USD. Um, just had a cup of hot chocolate too early, Donna. Donna, Donna, far too early. You want to save that, savor it for 23 minutes. Was he forced to print money? No, well, technically, he's meant to be independent, right? He's, he has oversight by Congress, but um, he basically can do whatever he likes. or well, the Fed presidents vote and, and, and he executes. So, no, I don't think you meant to. And given that he was a um, he was a Trump appointee and then stayed around in the, in, in the Biden administration. So th these guys are meant to be apolitical. I don't know if that's a possibility. What does the Fed CME watch tool show now, says Yevgeny? I'm not sure they updated quite as quickly as that. Um, so 98% of the market today expected a quarter percent rate hike, right? Which is exactly what we got. Um, for March, we are expecting another quarter percent hike, which... Are we? Hang on. So it's updated it for 50. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're expecting another quarter percent hike in, in, in March. Um, it has updated it. And then for May, 81%. And then for May, we're kind of split. For May, we're kind of thinking half the market is thinking um, we're going to stay where we are. 40% uh, of the market thinks it's going to go a little higher. And 10% are actually thinking we might get a cut in May. Really, like something would have to break for us to get a cut in May, I would have thought. Now, the SPY is recovering. Uh, it's rallying. Even the QQQ is rallying. So market reacting very positively to this. Bear in mind, Jay Powell will be browsing on his Bloomberg terminal as, as, as I am uh, and, um, you know, watching or whatever, the stock chart and, and going, ooh, that's not quite what I wanted now, is it? Financial conditions are going to ease some more. Is that really what I wanted to achieve today? Probably not. So I think that's really the big story here. Let's pick up how media looks at this. Fed opts for small rate hike, still expects to deliver ongoing increases. They don't even get the main headline anymore. I mean, he must be livid, right? Only the side story. So Indian bloke gets the main story. And here is, hang on. Fed hikes benchmark rate by 25 basis points as expected. Slows rate hike signals further increases are coming. Yeah, note the plural there, right? Uh, they, see, they mentioned increases. Key takes away from the decision to raise rates a quarter point. Stocks drop. Well, they didn't. They rallied again. A statement repeats prior language on ongoing increases. Language suggests Fed, inc Fed inclined towards quarter point rate hikes at next two meetings uh, rather than a towards a pause after March. The Fed says inflation has eased somewhat, but remains elevated um, and omitted the public health warning. So apparently they're no longer worried about COVID. No more masks in the Fed building, perhaps. Decision is unanimous. It tends to be, doesn't it? It's the same thing with you know dictatorships. You also get unanimous decisions in those. Uh, James, um, you managed to buy the dip before the bankers did. Um, that's that's cool. That's brilliant. Appreciate you tuning in. It is 25 basis points. You're absolutely right. Um, election year 2024. Interesting one. Yeah, well, typically the market does very well with the, the um, two years before presidential elections. Um, can't say why. I mean, you know, labor market and all sorts of things. Um, you could you could you could have some interesting conversations about that, which I'm not going to get into conspiracy theories here. But if you want to look at the live market here, what's rallying today? Baidu up 12%, AMD up 10%. Wow, that's a whopper. Uh, Nvidia 4%. That's why I didn't do a trade on that yesterday. AMD. I thought it was going to be unpredictable. It was. Uh, Chinese stocks rallying. SoFi up 3%. Um, the whole growth sector up. Tesla up 1.6%. Nestle up. Netflix up 1%. Anything down? Snap, um, Lucid down 2%, Blackstone down 1.5%, Macy's down at 1 point, PayPal down 0 0.8%, Twitter apparently going to release a payment feature which could threaten PayPal's gigantum hold of the, that whole space. So banks coming down, um, which is generally we would think that that would mean rates are not going to go as high as we would expect. Let's also have a look at bonds because 
Where are we? Where are our bonds? Here we go. Uh, Americas. So the 10 year has dropped 1%. Is that true? US 10 year dropped 1% here. Uh, what about the, the two year? The two year is up a little. So the sh market's kind of saying, well, rates might go a little higher uh, in the short term, but maybe they're going to come down quicker than we previously thought. So I can't possibly think that that's what the Fed wants. And we still have a massive inversion, right? The two year has a yield of 4.2%, the 10 year at 3.5. It's basically screaming recession. So it's an interesting, it's going to be a very interesting year, very interesting year for uh, certainly for traders. Is this the worst crash? Correct, uh, says Elon Tusk. Uh, what do you mean? Not financial, but if you're that bullish for 2024, you might as well buy some leaps, Simon. No, uh, if you buy a leap, it loses money every single day. Uh, time decay works against you. I, I don't see why I would do that. Um, maybe you want to sell one, if that's really how you were, you were bullish, uh, then, then you could do that. But I wouldn't really buy a leap. Peloton up uh, significantly. Yep, sort of from the brink of bankruptcy, they seem to be alive again. Roblox popping. Uh, interesting. Today, investors is not dumb to follow cheap talk. Jerome is going to sp sprint on the situation. Um, yeah, so we basically, guys, have uh, 15 minutes till Jay Powell speaks. Uh, so far, the market taking this with some enthusiasm. Um, the question is, is this more enthusiasm than we'd, we'd want there to be? Uh, I leave you to be the judge of that. I, I still struggle to see the fundamental story here. Um, if we look at uh, SPX, um, has the economy fundamentally improved? I don't really see it. Uh, earnings are not terrible, but also not great. Um, now on the S&P, 4,100 is our, our barrier, essentially. That's our resistance line. So we could retest that today, entirely possible. But let's see what JP comes out with. I don't think he's going to be pleased with himself that he made the markets go up by a third of a percentage points with his statement. I don't really think that's that's the way he wanted it to go. But yeah, so far, markets reacting positively to this 0.25% interest rate increase, which is exactly what we were expecting. But the juice is definitely in the live press conference that's going to kick off here in 15 minutes. Um, and I am just going to set that up for you guys so you can see that as well let me just mute that and hang on share screen chrome tab there we go and we're going to not want to show that yet because let me mute it as well But yeah, we're going to have that live press conference up here in a, in a moment and um, do that exactly. And then I'm going to show it to you on, on the main screen because that's kind of the important part here. We can, we can use Bloomberg in a moment. Uh, so here it is. Um, I'll pop it open on another, another screen so we can see it when they come live. I keep an eye on it. Um, so yeah, that's what we're here for, basically. The real juicy part picks up in 15 minutes. So feel free uh, to ask any questions here while we've got uh, 15 minutes or, or thereabouts. Papa P about to lay the smack down, says Joe. What about the DXI, Felix? That's a good question. DXY. Uh, the dollar. So dollar coming down a little bit here today, 0.28%. Uh, that's essentially the market saying we don't think rates are going to go as high. And that's also what we're seeing from the bond market, right? The 10-year coming down. So the dollar rally kind of coming down here. That might also obviously have something to do with what's happening in Europe at the same time. Um, rate decisions over there as well and so on. Uh, but we are retesting here this sort of support of about 101 or thereabouts, which is going to be an interesting mark, but significantly below the 200-day moving average line. So, yeah, it's certainly looking like it's coming down pretty hard here. NDTH, that's what it is. What is NDTH? NDTH. Uh, oh, Nasdaq stocks about 200 day average. Yeah, it's interesting to see that. Like, how many stocks are above the average line of Nasdaq? You know, it's, it's a good data point to look at. I don't think it's the be all end all, but it's an interesting data point to look at, Rollers. Uh, thanks for throwing that out. I do think the Powell speaks with the US president, but I, I don't know what capacity or what frequency, to be honest with you. 
Um, some of you Americans probably know the answer to that one. Kyle, you're on the Zoom as well. Brilliant. Um, is Patrick doing a live trading stream? Is he? Um, that's brilliant. Um, so Kyle, one of our coaching students, uh, one of our head coaches normally runs the live trading session. So he trades these kind of events live and you can see exactly how he does that um, with real money. What broker do you use to trade options in Europe, Lucas? Interactive brokers is, is, or, or, or uh, Tastyworks also gives you access to, to most things. Uh, Greg, video quality isn't one, 1080. Uh, it should be. Um, change it on your end. That would probably work. Can you look at Microsoft? It says die gladly. MSFT. I have quite a lot of Microsoft stock. I'm picking up a little bit here this morning, or this morning, this afternoon. Well, not really picking up. 0.15% down. Um, I'd say, I mean, I haven't looked at the options market of this, but I would say you probably have some resistance at sort of 256 or thereabouts. Um, you know, earnings were decent, but not wonderful. So it's just kind of squeezed up with the rest of the market. I don't think it's got anything to do with Microsoft here. Sinister Angel smells a trap. Uh, Richard says Tesla, please. Look at Tesla. So, yeah, that, that was a huge trade, right? We did a 550% trade on, 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 on uh, percent return trade on Tesla. Um, if you guys want to get your hands on those kind of trades, uh, they're part of our newsletter, newsletter.org slash trade. Um, you can sign up for that. There's a free trial as well. We've got a new trade out just yesterday, uh, which is still very, very much valid. It has moved yet. We expect that stock to come down about 70 percentage points. And we set up an options trade. We explained to you exactly how that options trade works. And you can set it up at $145 risk. And you can possibly lose. Um, and um, eight, eight, eight time red times return on that. So you could have up to the next So you go to Trading Floor Whispers, which is the link down below, Felix Transadorx slash trade. And you can sign up for a free trial of the gold tier here. There's a monthly and a yearly one. The yearly one is 24 people. So that's the last thing you so, yeah, I think we've squeezed up quite a lot here. Um, the squeeze is probably done. I haven't looked at the options market at, uh, as of today. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of, it's, when you see a rally like that, you tend to be a little bit late. <laughs> you know what I mean? Unless you think fundamentally something is strange about Tesla, which I don't particularly. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry, guys. Um, that's because there was another video playing in the background. I think that should be better, right? Um, Andrea, is that better? I think it probably is. So we should be back. It's when I play another video in the background to live stream. I can't talk over it. Um, it makes it horrific uh, for your, your gentle ears, which is not what we want, obviously. We should be back. Um, Andrea, indeed. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, I, I do that always on these live streams, right? Uh, I play it in the background. Uh, so yeah, we've got 10 minutes till Jay Powell speaks. So feel free to ping me questions here. I'll be super happy to answer them. Uh, so far, the market has um, reacted a little bit positively, but not a lot. We're up 0.1%. The market not really trusting this is good news either. So we're sort of like bouncing sideways, not going in any particular direction here. I've got QQQ open down here, which you would expect to move significantly on good or bad news. And um, it just hasn't really. It's popped a little bit. It's coming down again, popping a little bit again. So the market's sort of going, ah, well, Jay Powell's going to speak soon. That could be unpleasant for my portfolio. Um, Danza, do you know the sound boom above the cam? No, we thought about doing that. I haven't actually done that yet. But no, the sound issues typically come more from interference from software uh, rather than from, from the outside. Um, can you look at BA at over 215? Let me have a look at, whoops. Let me do that. BA. Went on a 215 minute interval. That's a bit random, isn't it? Uh, this is Boeing. Wow, really nice run, hey? Really, really nice run. So you've got some resistance here, right? At 223 and then up there again at sort of 230, 229. That's kind of where I would see the resistance, these, these peaks here from end of 2021 um, but you know war is good for some right christopher uh, like the smash button appreciate that very much
Um, any thoughts about the McLaren signaling another crash? I'm kind of with them on that, to be honest with you. I, I'm not, I, I don't like to make like doom and gloom videos and stuff because it just screams like it's cheap clickbait, but I like to just say it as I see it. And at the moment, I'm kind of with JP Morgan on that. That's how we started off this call here uh, today, which let me just show that to you again, uh, which is essentially, what do they say today? They said, positioning is similar to August 2022, which preceded a 17% decline in the SPX. That's the SP500. And that's kind of the way I look at it. I don't really see like the rationale behind this rally. We've got bad earnings. The market goes up. So you might say, well, that's bullish. It means the market can handle bad news. But I think we are not quite appreciative of the money shredding and what a recession actually does. Do you think the debt ceiling will be elevated again? Well, if it isn't, the world is over. Seriously, of course, it has to be. There's no other choice unless the idiots in, in Washington suddenly decide to not run a deficit, which is very unlikely because it's like how you buy votes, right? Likes per viewers at 3%. Should it raise to 5 or 4.75% America? I appreciate that. Guys, do you know where the like button is? Come on, smash it. I truly appreciate it. You could algorithm would truly appreciate it as well. Felix, we want to see you with short hair. That's fairly unlikely to happen. It grows like mad. Um, it grows like a sheep. Sideways cash is bullish, um, says Oleg. There is still a fair bit of cash on the side, but funds have chased this rally. So it's not looking quite as bullish as it did at the beginning of January. Mohammed, when is natural gas going to bounce back? I don't see it at the moment. I, I'm not a big gas uh, guy or a commodities guy for that matter, really. But if you look at um, natural gas spot, why is that traded in Mexico? It's a bit weird, isn't it? Um, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's coming down a lot. Why? Well, Europe's got plenty. Europe's got plenty of it. It's pretty warm. One of the warmest winters around. Um, storage capacity is full at levels more than it's ever been. So there isn't really a squeeze on gas here. Uh, CTA positions, KK. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a squeeze shot on that just from, come on, Microsoft. Why do you make it so hard to grab the corner of a window? You think someone's just sitting there and it's like it's teasing us with it? I think they probably are some deviant at, uh, at uh, Microsoft. Uh, Goldman saying since last Monday, we, if the market goes up, we the, the CTAs are going to buy about 27 billion of S&P for this month, right? Now, a, a week ago, that was going to be 42 billion. So we've come down from 42 billion to 27 billion buying. So less buying than, than previously. And the downside, if the market goes down, they're going to sell 191 billion over the next month. So the downside risk is significant. And I mean significantly significant. So that's the way I'm positioned. It's um, not, not shorting anything, anything like that, because I'd have, have, have a tremendous risk, but some limited risk trades that would benefit if the market went down, which is kind of what I expected to do. I might be wrong, though. Um, Andrea says the sound is fine. Uh, I trust Andrea. Andrea is a sound engineer, aren't you, Andrea? So he's 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 our sound man. Uh, but the CTA sell trigger is two standard deviations. Um, yeah, we need to come down a little. I mean, we come down a bit. Vol trigger is sits at two ninety one, for example. That isn't very far off, right? Drop below two ninety, you head towards two eighty, uh, and the ch the chasing really really kicks off. I I, I would say. MMM Martin, you got nothing open on your Interactive Brokers account and you're down money. That seems like a strange story. I don't know. Ask Interactive Brokers. Uh, do not believe anything Goldman Sachs says. Everybody has an agenda. Very true. Um, okay, guys. So are you ready? Are you ready? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? We've got um, four minutes left till Jay Powell opens his big beautiful mouth and is going to, in my view, he's going to aim to tank the market. Um, if you guys want to sign up for our free trial of the trade, 
idea newsletter we have links down below Felix friends along slash trade um, I did this trade yesterday uh, I paid 145 dollars for each trade I did a multiple of them obviously but um, I'm hoping for an eight percent profit on that and I explain to you exactly why and how to set that up um, and of course that isn't financial advice but you know it comes with the usual warnings of there being some risk in it but it's a free trial uh, you can sign up for the month 87 dollars a month if you sign up for the year you get 31 percent off as well and you can enjoy daily newsletters and lots of ideas we also sent you a, a an idea today of how you could literally hedge today, how you could have a, a zero risk day with events like today. And I think that's really important to understand. So check that out, guys. Now we are going to turn off um, Bloomberg and we're going to pop the Fed up here. And I'm going to press play on that in a second because when I do, my sound goes wonky, as you guys have just reminded me of. I probably need a little bit less space for writing. You could have a slightly larger Jay Powell because I know you want to see the man in his glory, right? Uh, don't you? I think you probably do. And um, I'll move myself as well. Where should I go? I should probably go down here, right? Down there is good. Yeah, so I can write notes on the left and give you commentary while he's talking. I can zip it, um, save my uh, vocal cords a little bit. Hussam, you're 90% cash. Okay, interesting. What's your what's your rationale with that, Hussam? Your 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 timing and entry, or what's what's the thought there? Here comes the crash. Well, let's see. We're completely flat so far, basically. Most boring Fed announcement so far, but the the fun always comes in the um, press conference, which is going to kick off here in literally two minutes. Uh, Robert, anything going on? Um, welcome, Robert. We got a quarter percent interest rate hike and not a lot of change in language so far. They basically just said labor markets tight, um, job markets tight, and you know, long-term target two percent sort of thing. So, Jan Soon, I want to buy the market, but it's so euphoric. Uh, Jan Soon sharing um, Rodos, you're ninety percent cash. A lot of you are in cash. Interesting. Um, what do you? What, what, what's your entry point? What are you waiting for? Um, what are you looking for to go to go? Um, you know, into the market again. At some point, you got to go back into the market. Otherwise, you're missing out, right? In the long run, you tend to miss the best days if you're in cash. That's usually that's usually the story. Do you think all has been priced in? Well, the rate hikes have. We know that much, pretty much. But not the longer term story. The market is expecting rate cuts this year and Jay Powell could tell us that that isn't going to happen here, right? Fernando, you're very kind. I appreciate your generosity. If you want to get some real value for that as well, head over to phoenixtransfer.org slash trade, sign up to our uh, trade newsletter. We give you uh, trade ideas. It's a daily newsletter. Uh, Robert, indeed, time in the market, not timing the market. I totally am with you on that. Um, I think he says no cuts this year. That would be a hawkish statement. The market definitely wouldn't like that. And Andrea's going to be 90% wine later. Um, Fed presidents are going to start talking again. I don't know when. Well, we've got we've got the head honcho of the Fed presidents, the Fed chair talking today. Let's focus on that for now. Uh, Felix bought some of those cheap puts the other day. I did. Yes, I did. I did. I like to, I like to be hedged. Meeting started on YouTube. It has. There we go, almost. My sound is bad, by the way, while that's on. So apologize for that. And no audio yet, but yeah, my audio is going to be a bit wonky while that's on, but you can guys can hear him when he comes on the stage. himself over the past year we've taken forceful actions to tighten the stance of monetary policy we've covered a lot of ground and the full effects of our rapid tightening so far are yet to be felt even so, we have more work to do. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. 
Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of labor market conditions that benefit all. Today, the FOMC raised our policy interest rate by 25 basis points. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. In addition, we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive stance for some time. I will have more to say about today's monetary policy actions after briefly reviewing economic developments. The U.S. economy slowed significantly last year, with real GDP rising at a below-trend pace of 1%. Recent indicators point to modest growth of spending and production this quarter. Consumer spending appears to be expanding at a subdued pace, in part reflecting tighter financial conditions over the past year. Activity in the housing sector continues to weaken, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. Despite the slowdown in growth, the labor market remains extremely tight, with the unemployment rate at a 50-year low, job vacancies still very high, and wage growth elevated. Job gains have been robust, with employment rising by an average of 247,000 jobs per month over the last three months. Although the pace of job gains has slowed over the course of the past year and nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, the labor market continues to be out of balance. Labor demand substantially exceeds the supply of available workers, and the labor force participation rate has changed little from a year ago. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in December, total PCE prices rose 5.0%. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.4%. The inflation data received over the past three months show a welcome reduction in the monthly pace of increases. And while recent developments are encouraging, we will need substantially more evidence to be confident that inflation is on a sustained downward path. Despite elevated inflation, longer term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. But that's not grounds for complacency. Although inflation has moderated recently, it remains too high. The longer the current bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to a returning inflation to our 2% objective. At today's meeting, the committee raised the target range for the federal funds rate by 25 basis points, bringing the target range to four and a half to four and three quarters percent. And we are continuing the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. With today's action, we have raised interest rates by four and a half percentage points over the past year. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. We are seeing the effects of our policy actions on demand in the most interest sensitive sectors of the economy, particularly housing. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. In light of the cumulative tightening of monetary policy and the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, the committee decided to raise interest rates by 25 basis points today, continuing the step down from last year's rapid pace of increases. Shifting to a slower pace will better allow the committee to assess the economy's progress toward our goals, 
as we determine the extent of future increases that will be required to attain a sufficiently restrictive stance. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting, take into a, taking into account the totality of incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation. We have been taking forceful steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply. Our overarching focus is using our tools to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. We will stay the course until the job is done. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Chris. Uh, Chris Rugebert, Associated Press, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, as you know, financial conditions have loosened since the fall with bond yields falling, uh, which has also brought down mortgage rates, uh, and the stock market posted a solid gain in January. Does that make your job of combating inflation harder? And could you see lifting rates higher than you otherwise would to offset the increase in, or to offset the easing of financial conditions? So it is important that overall financial conditions continue to reflect the policy restraint that we're putting in place in order to bring inflation down to 2%. And of course, financial conditions have tightened very significantly over the past year. Uh, I would say that our focus is not on short-term moves, but on sustained changes to broader financial conditions. And it is our judgment that we're not yet at a sufficiently restrictive policy stance, which is why we say that we expect ongoing hikes will be appropriate. Of course, many things affect financial conditions, uh, not just our policy. Um, and we will take into account overall financial conditions along with many other factors as, as we set policy. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you for taking our questions. Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Over the last quarter, we've seen a deceleration in prices, in wages, and a fall in consumer spending, all while the unemployment rate has been able to stay at a historic low. Does this at all change your view of how much the unemployment rate would need to go up, if at all, to see inflation come down to the levels you're looking for? So I, I would say it is, it is a good thing that the, the disinflation that we have seen so far has not come at the expense of a weaker labor market. But I would also say that, that that disinflationary process that you now see underway uh, is really at an early stage. Uh, what you see is really uh, in the goods sector, you see inflation uh, now coming down uh, because uh, supply chains have been fixed, demand is shifting back to services and uh, uh, shortages are, have been abated. So you see that in the, um, uh, in the, in the, in the other, in, in the uh, housing services sector, we expect inflation to continue moving up uh, for a while, but then to come down, assuming that new leases continue to be lower. So in those two sectors, you've got a good story. Uh, the issue is that we have a, a large sector called non-housing service, core non-housing services, where we don't see disinflation yet. But I, I would say that um, so far, what we see is uh, is progress, but without without any weakening in labor market conditions. Has um, your ex oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Has your expectation for where the unemployment rate might go changed since December? You know, we're going to write down uh, new forecasts at the March meeting, and we'll see at that time. I will say that it is gratifying to see the disinflationary process now getting underway, and we continue to get strong labor market data. Uh, so, but you know, we'll update those forecasts in, in March. Neil. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with Axios. Um, uh, you and some of your colleagues have emphasized the possibility that job openings could come down and that uh, that would let some of the air out of the labor market without major job losses. We saw the opposite in the December jolts this morning, uh, job openings actually rising. 
uh, that also has co coincided with with uh, slowdown in wage inflation. Uh, do you believe that openings are an important indicator to be studying to, to understand where the labor market is and where wage inflation might be heading? So you're right about the data, of course. What we um, we did see, we've seen uh, average hourly earnings and now the uh, employment cost index abating a little bit, still off of their highs of six months ago and, and more, but still at levels that are that are that are fairly elevated. Um, the job openings uh, number has in jolts has been quite volatile that, uh, recently, and I did see that it moved up back up this morning. I, I do think that uh, it's probably an important indicator. The, the ratio, I guess, is back up to 1.9 job openings to um, uh, to unemployed people, people who are looking for work. So it's an it's an indicator, but nonetheless, we you're right. We do see uh, wages moving down. If you look across the rest of the labor market, you still see very high. Uh, uh, payroll job creation, um, and, uh, uh, you know, quits are still at an elevated level. So many, many, by many, many indicators, uh, the job market is still very strong. Um, Colby and then Howard. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. Uh, given the economic data since the December meeting, is the trajectory for the Fed funds rate in the most recent SEP still the best guidepost uh, for the policy path forward? Uh, or does ongoing now mean uh, more than two uh, rate rises now? So you're right. At the December meeting, we all wrote down our, our best estimates of, of what we thought the ultimate level would be. And that's obviously back in December. And the median for that was between five and five and a quarter percent. Um, at the March meeting, we're going to update those assessments. We did not update them today. We did, however, continue to say that we believe ongoing rate hikes will be appropriate to attain a, a sufficiently restrictive stance of policy to bring inflation back down to 2%. Um, we think we've covered a lot of ground and financial conditions have certainly tightened. Uh, and I would say uh, we still think there's work to do there. We haven't made a decision on, on exactly where that will be. I think, you know, we're going to be looking carefully at the incoming data between now and the March meeting and then the May meeting. Um, I, I, uh, I don't feel a lot of certainty about uh, where that where that will be. It could certainly be higher than we're writing down right now. If we come to the view that we need to write down uh, to, you know, to to move rates up beyond what we said in December, we would certainly do that. At the same time, if the data come in in the other direction, then we'll you know, we'll make data dependent decisions at coming meetings, of course. Just as a quick follow-up, how are you viewing the kind of balance of risk between those two options of, um, you know, the, the likelihood of maybe falling short of that or, or going beyond that level? I, I guess I would say it this way. Um, I continue to think that uh, it's very difficult to manage the risk of doing too little and finding out in six or 12 months that we actually were close but didn't get the job done and inflation springs back and we have to go back in. And now you really do worry about expectations getting uh, unanchored and that kind of thing. This is a very difficult risk to manage. Whereas, uh, I, you know, of course, we, we have no incentive and no desire to to over tighten. But we, you know, if we if we feel like we've gone too far, we can certainly could, could certain and inflation is coming down faster than we expect, then we have tools that would that would work on that. So I, I do think that in this situation where we have still the highest inflation in 40 years, you know, the job is not fully done. As I mentioned, started to mention earlier, we have a, a sector that represents 56% of the core inflation index where we don't see disinflation yet. So we, we don't see it, it's not happening yet. Inflation in, in uh, core services X, uh, X housing is still running at 4% on a six and 12 month basis. So there's not nothing happening there. In the other two sectors representing, you know, less than 50%, you actually, I think now have a, a story that is credible that's coming together, although you don't actually see disinflation yet in housing services, but but it's in the pipeline, right? So for the, for the third sector, we, we don't see anything here. So I think it would be premature, it would be very premature to declare victory or to, to think that we've really got this. We need to see, our, our goal, of course, is to bring inflation down. And how do, we, how do we get that done? There are many, many factors driving inflation in that sector. And they should be coming into play to have inflation, the disinflationary process begin in that sector. But so far, we don't see that. And I think until we do, we see ourselves as having a lot of work left to do. 
uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters, and, and thanks as usual. So I just wanted to connect a couple of dots here. The statement made a number of, of changes uh, that seem to be saying things are getting better. You're saying inflation has eased. Has eased. Uh, that's new. Uh, you've taken out references to the war in Ukraine as causing price increases. You've taken out references to the <coughs> pandemic. You've uh, eliminated all the reasons that you said prices were being driven higher. Yet that's not mapping to any change in how you describe policy. We still have ongoing increases to come. So I'm wondering, why is that the case? And does it have more to do with uncertainty around the outlook or more to do with you not wanting to give a very overeager market a reason to get ahead of itself and overreact? So I guess I would, uh, would say it this way. Uh, we can now say, I think, for the first time that the disinflationary process has started. We can see that, and we see it really in goods prices so far. Goods prices is a big sector. We, this is what we thought would happen since the very beginning, and now here it is actually happening. And for the reasons we thought, we, you know, it's supply chains, it's shortages, and it's demand revolving back towards services. So this is a good thing. This is a good thing. But that's you know around a quarter of the PCE price index, core PCE price index. So the second sector is is housing services, and that's driven by very different things. And we, as I mentioned, with housing services, we expect, and other forecasters expect, that measured inflation will continue moving up for several months, but will then come down, assuming that, that new leases continue to be soft. And we do assume that. So we think that that's sort of in the pipeline. And we actually see disinflation in the goods sector, and we see it in the pipeline for two sectors that amount to a little less than half. So this, this is good. And that, we note that when we say inflation is coming down, that this is good. We expect to see that that disinflation process will be seen, we hope soon, in the core goods uh, X housing, sorry, the core, core services X housing sector that I talked about. We don't see it yet. It's, you know, it's, a, it's seven or eight different kinds of services. Uh, not all of them are the same. And, you know, we have a sense of what's going on in each of those different uh, subsections. Um, uh, uh, probably the biggest part of it, probably 60% of, of that will is, you know, uh, research would show is sensitive to slack in the economy. And so the labor market will probably be important. Some of the other ones, it's, the labor market's not going to be important. Many other factors will drive it. In any case, we don't see disinflation in that sector yet. And I think we need to see that it's the majority of the core PCE index, which is the thing that we think is the best predictor of headline PCE, which is our mandate. So it's not that we're not, we're neither optimistic nor pessimistic. We're just telling you that we, we don't see inf inflation moving down yet in that large sector. I think we will fairly soon, but we don't see it yet. Until we do, I think we, you know, we see ourselves, we got to be honest with ourselves, we see ourselves as having perhaps more persistent, we'll see more persistent inflation in that sector, which will take longer to get down. Um, and we're just going to have to we have to complete the job. I mean, that's that's what we're here for. <clears throat> Nick Timoros, The Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, you observed several years ago that we learned we can have a low unemployment rate without above target inflation. And we have learned lately that inflation can come down from its uncomfortably high level despite a historically low unemployment rate. Given that and, and given how much you did over the last year, why do you think further rate increases are needed? Why not stop here and see what transpires in the coming months before raising rates again? So we, you know, we've raised rates four and a half percentage points, and we're talking about a couple of more rate hikes to get to that level we think is appropriately restrictive. And why do we think that's probably necessary? We think because inflation is still running very hot. We're, of course, taking into account long and variable lags, and we're thinking about that. Um, it really, it, it, the story we're telling about inflation is, in, to ourselves, and the way we understand it is we're basically the three things that I've just gone through a couple times. And again, we don't see it affecting the services sector X, X housing yet. Um, but I mean, I think our assessment is that we're not very far from that level. Uh, we don't know that, though. We don't know that. So I think we're, we're, you know, we're living in a world of significant uncertainty. I would look across the the rate the, the spectrum of rates and see that real rates are now positive, right by you know by an appropriate uh, set of measures or positive across the yield curve. I think policy is restrictive. We're trying to make a, a fine judgment about how much is restrictive enough. That's all. And we're going to you know that's why we're slowing down to 25 basis points. We're going to be carefully watching the economy. 
and watching inflation and watching the progress of the disinflationary process. Did you or your colleagues discuss <clears throat> the, the conditions for a pause at this meeting uh, this week? We, you know, you'll see that the minutes will come out in three weeks and we'll give you a lot of detail. I, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the path ahead and, uh, and the state of the economy. And uh, I wouldn't want to start to drive the, describe all the details there, but that was the sense of the discussion was really talking quite a bit about the path forward. Victoria. Um, hi, Chair Powell. I wanted to ask about um, the debt ceiling. Um, given that we've now hit up against it, um, I was wondering if the U.S. goes past the X date, will the Fed do whatever the Treasury directs as it relates to making payments as the fiscal agent, or will it do its, do its own analysis of any legal constraints? So your question is, would we say your question again? Will the Fed do what Treasury directs as it relates to making payments, or will it do its own analysis of any legal constraints? So you're really asking about, but I, I, you're asking about prioritization, in effect. Is what yes. You're, okay. Yes. So I, I, I feel like I have to say this: there's only one way forward here, and that is for Congress to raise the debt ceiling so that the United States government can pay all of its obligations when due, and any deviations from that path would be highly risky and that no one should assume that the Fed can protect the economy from the consequences of failing to act in a timely manner. In terms of our relationship with the Treasury, we are their fiscal agent, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. Are, are you actively doing any planning of, of what might happen in the event that that would happen? I'm, I'm just gonna leave it at that. This is a matter that's to be resolved between really, it's really Congress's job to raise the debt ceiling, and uh, I gather there are discussions happening, but they don't involve us, we're, we're not, uh, we're not involved in those discussions, so we're the fiscal agent. <clears throat> Gina and then Steve. Uh, Gina Smiley from the New York Times. Thanks for taking our questions. I wonder, was there any discussion today of the possibility of pausing rate increases and then restarting them? Lori Logan from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas seemed to suggest that that would be a possibility in a recent speech, and I wonder if that view is broadly shared on the committee. So um, the committee, obviously, did not see this as a time to pause. We judged that the appropriate you know, thing to do at this meeting was to raise the federal funds rate by 25 basis points, and we said that we continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range will be appropriate in order to attain that stance of sufficiently restrictive monetary policy that will bring inflation down to 2%. So that's, that's the judgment that we made. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to write down new forecasts in March, and uh, uh, and we'll you know we'll certainly be looking at the incoming data as everyone else will. Sorry, I should have been clear. I mean, would it be possible to take a meeting off, for example, and then resume? You know, could you rather than just doing at every meeting a move, go a little bit more slowly, take some gaps in between moves? I mean, <clears throat> I think I, this is not something that the committee is thinking about or exploring in any kind of detail. In principle, though. You know, we used to think we used to do was go every other meeting, if you remember, 25 basis points, and that was considered a fast pace. Um, so, I think a lot of options are available, and uh, I mean, you saw what the Bank of Canada did, and you know, they left it that they're willing to to raise rates after pausing. But this is not something that this is not something that the that the uh, Federal Open Market Committee is uh, on the on the point of deciding right now. <clears throat> Steve Leesman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, um, the SEP has the uh, PCE inflation rate in 2023 at 3.1%. Meanwhile, the three-month annualized PCE is 2.1%, and you've achieved this uh, without going to your 5.1% uh, funds rate, which is what you have penciled in for this year. Um, and you've also achieved it without the one percentage point increase in the unemployment rate, which you have penciled in for this year. I'm wondering if you've considered the idea of whether or not um, your understanding of the inflation dynamic may be wrong, and uh, it's possible to achieve these things without raising rates that high, um, and also without um, uh, without the surge in unemployment. And specifically, I wonder if you might comment on the uh, speech given by uh, Vice Chair Lel Brannard, who said, to the extent that inputs other than wages may have been responsible in part for important price increases for some non-housing services, an unwinding of these factors. In other words, it may not be wages the idea that it may not require unemployment rising to get this sector of inflation under control. Thanks. 
So a couple things. First, on the <clears throat> on the forecast, um, you, if you're right. If you take very short term, three three months, say measures of PCE core PCE inflation, they, they're quite low right now. But that's because that's driven by uh, you know significantly negative readings from goods uh, inflation. Most forecasters and uh, would would think that the that the significantly negative readings will be transitory, and that goods inflation will move up fairly soon back up to its longer run trend of something around zero, something like that. So, a lot of forecasts would call for core PCE to go back up to four percent by the middle of the year, for example. So, that's really where the sustainable level is is more like at four percent. So, that would suggest there's there's work left to do. Uh, you know, let's let's say inflation does come down much faster than we expect, which is which is possible. As I mentioned, you know, obviously our policy is data dependent. We would take that into account. In terms of of um, the non, sorry, the core non housing services, as as I mentioned earlier, it's a very diverse sector, six or seven sectors, and um, so sectors that represent fifty five or sixty percent of that uh, subsectors of of that sector. Um, are we think are sensitive to slack in the economy, sensitive to the labor market in a way, but some of the other sectors are, are not. And for example, you know, financial services is a big sector that's really not driven by by uh, by uh, uh, labor labor markets wages. Um, so that's why I said there there are a number of things that will affect take 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 restaurants right. So clearly, labor is important for restaurants, but so are food prices. And you know, transportation services is going to be driven by by uh, fuel prices, uh, for example. So there are lots of things in that mix that will drive inflation. I would say overall, though, my own view would be that you're not going to have a you know a sustainable return to two percent inflation in that sector without a better balance in the labor market. And um, I don't know what that will require in terms of of increased unemployment. Your question. Um, I do think uh, there are a number of dimensions through which the labor market can soften. And uh, so far, we've, we've, we've got, as I mentioned, in goods, we have inflation moving down without the softening in the labor market. I think most forecasters would say that, uh, that unemployment will probably rise a bit from here. But I still think, I continue to think, that there's a path to getting inflation back down to 2% without a really significant economic decline or a significant increase in unemployment. And that's that's because this the, you know the, the setting we're in is quite different. The, the the inflation that we originally got was very much a collision between very strong demand and hard supply constraints. Not something that you really have seen in in prior uh, you know in prior business cycles. And so now we see goods inflation coming down for the reasons we thought, and um, we we understand why housing inflation will come down. And I think will a story will emerge on on the. Uh, non-housing services sector soon enough but i think there is there's ongoing disinflation and we don't yet see uh you know we don't yet see weakening in the labor market so we'll have to see can we get there with five percent certainly possible yeah absolutely it's possible you know it's a question no one really knows i think it's because this is this this is not like the other business cycles in so many ways um it may well be uh that as as that it will take more slowing than than we expect than I expect to get inflation down to two percent. But I don't I don't. That's not my base case. My base case is that uh, the economy can return to two percent inflation without a really significant downturn or a really big increase in unemployment. I think that's that's a possible outcome. Um, I think many many forecasters would say it's not the most likely outcome, but but I, I would say there's there's a there's a chance of it. Michael. Uh, Michael McKee from Bloomberg TV and Radio. I'd like to pick up on uh, what you were just saying about a uh, substantial downturn and ask with uh, the full weight of your tightening not in place yet and uh, with the progress against inflation, there's still a lot of talk about uh, very, very slow growth going forward in 2023. And the recession indicators are all suggesting uh, that we are going to see recession this year. So I'm wondering if you've changed your view or you have a more nuanced view of what you think the danger to uh, economic growth is going forward and whether you're very close to uh, perhaps tipping it into 
the wrong place, which calls for more restraint on your part. So I, I do think you most forecasts and, and you know my own assessment would be that that uh, growth will continue, positive growth will continue, but at a subdued pace, as it did last year. We had growth of uh, GDP growth of one percent last year, and also final sales growth, which you think is which we think is a better indicator of about one percent. I think you know most forecasts and and certainly my assessment would be that growth will continue at at, at a fairly uh, subdued level this year. Um, there are other factors, though, that need to be considered. You you will have seen that the global picture is uh, is improving a bit, uh, and and that will matter for us potentially. The labor market remains very very strong, and that's job creation, that's wages. Um, as inflation does come down, sentiment will improve. You also um, state and local governments are are really flush these days with uh, with you know, money, and many of them are considering tax cuts or even sending checks. So I think that's going to support. They're also spending a lot. There's a lot of spending coming in the construction pipeline, both private and public. And so that's going to support economic activity. So I, I think there's a there's, there's a good chance that that those factors will help support positive growth this year. And that's my base case is is that 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 there will be positive growth this year. Rich. Thank you. Rich Miller from Bloomberg. First of all, uh, how are you doing? Uh, Fine, thanks. Fine. Good. good. Uh, second off, um, I think it's earlier on in the press conference, you, you, you said you uh, need to see substantially more evidence uh, uh, of inflation com uh, coming down. Uh, can you give us some idea of what you're thinking of? You mentioned three months that we've seen three months in a row. Governor Waller suggested he might want to see six months. Is it just the inflation data, or do you have to see the uh, the labor market coming back into better balance to have that substantially more evidence? Uh, so I, I don't think there's a you know going to be a light switch flipped or anything like that. I think it's just an accumulating accumulation of evidence. So of course we'll be looking by the time of, of the March meeting, we'll have two more employment reports, two more CPI reports, and we'll be looking at those carefully as as all of us will, and we'll be asking ourselves what are they telling us and and uh, uh, soon after that, we'll have another uh, ECI uh, uh, wage report, which, as you know, is is a report that we we like because it, it adjusts for composition and it's very complete. And uh, you know, the one we got, uh, I guess it was yesterday, was um, was constructive. It's you know, it's, it shows wages coming down, but still at a, at a high level. They're still they're still at, at a level that's way above where, well above where they were before the uh, uh, before the uh, pandemic. So. I, I don't want to put a number on it in terms of months, but as, as the accumulated evidence comes in, it's going to be reflected in our assessment of the outlook, and that will be that will be reflected in our policy over time. But I, I will say though, we, you know, it is our job to restore price stability and achieve two percent inflation for the benefit of the American public. We're not market participants have a very different job. And it's a fine job. It's a great job. I, I did that job for for years, but. Um, in one form or another, but uh, you know we have to deliver that, and so we are strongly resolved that we will you know complete this task because we think it has benefits that will uh, you know support economic activity and benefit the public for for many many years. Edward. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Fed Chairman, um, for taking the questions. So you've talked about we had solid. Uh, job growth. Um, Edward Lawrence from Fox Business, by the way. We had solid job growth, a uh, slight falling in the increase in consumer spending. Um, it seems so far it's been relatively mild uh, from the economy to go to from a 9.1% CPI inflation to 6.5% CPI inflation. Is the hard part yet to come to go from 65 to 2? I don't think we know, honestly. You know, the uh, so we, of course, expected goods inflation to start coming down by the end of 2021, and it didn't. It didn't come down all through 22, and now it's coming down, and it's coming down pretty fast. So I would say these are. This is not a standard business cycle where you can look at the last 10 times there was a global pandemic and we shut the economy down, and uh, Congress did what it did and we did what we. Did. It's just it's unique. So I think certainty is just not appropriate here. Inflation. It's just harder to forecast inflation. It may come down faster. It may take longer to come down. And you know our job is to deliver inflation back to target, and we will do that. But I think we 
we're going to be cautious about about declaring victory and you know sending signals that uh, that we think that the the game is won because it you know it's we've got a long way to go. It's just it's the early stages of disinflation, and the, it's most welcome to be able to say that that we are now in disinflation, but. That's great, but we we just see that it has to spread through the economy, and that it's going to take some time. That's all. Do you, how long do you see then the federal funds rate remaining at this elevated level? You know, so our, again, our, the, my forecast and that of my colleagues, as you will see from the SEP, and I mean there are many different forecasts, but generally it's a forecast of slower growth, some softening in labor market conditions, and inflation moving down, moving down steadily, but not quickly. And in that case. Uh, if, if the economy performs broadly in line with those expectations, it will not be appropriate to, to cut rates this year, to loosen policy this year. Of course, other people have forecasts with, with inflation coming down much faster. That's a different thing. You know, if that happens, if inflation comes down much faster, you know, then we'll be seeing that and, and it will be incorporated into our thinking about policy. Simon. Thank you, Chair Powell. Simon Rinovich with The Economist. I may ask a, a further question about the language around ongoing increases. Uh, that, of course, implies at least two further rate rises. Uh, if you look at Fed fund futures pricing, uh, the implication is that you'll raise rates one more time uh, and then pause. Are you concerned about that divergence, uh, or do you think if everything breaks right, is that is that a plausible outcome? I'm, I'm not. I'm not particularly concerned about about the divergence, no, because it's it is largely due to the market's expectation that inflation will move down more quickly. I think that's that's the the, the bigger part of that. Um, so again, as as I just mentioned, we uh, you know our forecasts. There are different participants have different forecasts, but generally those forecasts are for continued subdued growth, some softening in the labor market, but not a recession, not a recession, and and we have inflation moving down. Um, you know, into the somewhere in the mid threes or maybe lower than that this year. We'll update that in March, but that's what we thought in December. Markets are, are past that. They, they show inflation coming down in some cases much quicker than that. So we'll just have to see. Um, and we have a different view and a different view to different forecast, really. Um, and uh, given our outlook, I, I, I just I don't see us cutting rates this year if we get our if our outlook turns true. As I mentioned just now, if, if we do see inflation coming down much more quickly, that'll that'll play into our policy saying, of course. Scott. Hi, Chair Powell. Scott Horsley for NPR. Um, one of the changes in the statement this, this month is that the committee is no longer listing public health as among <clears throat> the data points you'll consider in assessing conditions. What should we make of that? Does the Federal Reserve no longer see the pandemic as, as weighing on the economy? That's the general sense of it. Look, we understand, I personally understand well that, that, that uh, COVID is still out there, um, but uh, it, it, that it's no longer playing an important role in our economy. And, you know, we've kept that statement in there for, uh, for quite a while. And I think we just, we knew we would take it out at some point. There's never a perfect time. But we thought that, uh, you know, people are handling it better and the economy and the society are handling it better now. It doesn't really need to be in a, you know, in the Fed's uh, uh, monthly uh, or, you know, meet post meeting statement as an ongoing economic risk as opposed to, you know, a health issue. Nancy. <clears throat> Hi, Chair Powell, Nancy Marshall Genser uh, with Marketplace. Wanted to go back to another thing that Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainerd said recently. Um, she said she doesn't see signs of a wage price spiral. And I'm wondering if you agree with that. I do. Yeah, I do. I, I, I don't see that yet. But the whole point is, you know, if you once you see it, it you're, you, you have a serious problem. That, that, that means that effectively in people's decision making, inflation has become a really salient issue. And once that happens, that's what, you, that's what we can't let, allow to happen. And, you know, so that's why we worry that the longer we're at this and the longer people are talking about inflation all day long, every day, um, you know, the, the more risk of something like that. But no, there's, there's not much, it's, it's more of a risk. It always has been more of a risk than anything else. By the way, I think it's becoming less salient. And people are, you know, we, we pick that up in conversations. And I've seen some data, too, that show people are, you know, gradually, they're glad that inflation's coming down. People really don't like inflation. And as we see it coming down, 
that could also add a boost to economic activity. You, you look at the sentiment uh, surveys now, and they're very, very low, with three and a half percent unemployment and you know high wage increases nominally by historical standards. Why can that be? It has to be inflation, right? So uh, I think once inflation is seen to be coming down in, in coming months, even you will also see a, a boost to sentiment. I hope. So that's what you're looking at most closely is consumer expectations. That's that's at the very heart is consumers and businesses that, you know, are the essentially we believe that uh, expectations of future inflation are very and a very important part of the process of creating inflation. That's that's a that's a sort of a bedrock belief uh, in one way or another. It, it, it has to be it, we think it's important. Um, and uh, in this case, I would say the risk eight months ago or so. Longer term inflation expectations had moved up. We moved quite vigorously last year. Expectations are seem to be well anchored, including at the shorter end now, not just the longer end. So it's, you know, and that's, I think that's very reassuring. I think, you know, the markets have decided and the public has decided that inflation is going to come back down to 2%. And it's just a matter of us following through. That's immeasurably helpful to the process of getting inflation down. The fact that people now do generally believe that it will come down, that'll be part of the process of getting it down. And it's a very positive thing. Thank you, Chair Powell, Greg Robb from Market Watch. In the minutes of the December meeting, there was a, a couple sentences that struck people as important. When the committee said, participants talked about this unwarranted easing of financial conditions was a risk and it would make your life harder to bring inflation down. Are, I haven't seen heard you talk much about that today or in the statement. So I was wondering, has that concern eased among members or is that still something you're concerned about? Thank you. I, I would put it this way. It's something that we monitor carefully. Financial conditions didn't really change much from the December meeting to now. They mostly went sideways or up and down, but came out in roughly the same place. Um, it's important that the markets do reflect the tightening that we're putting in place. As we've, as we've discussed a couple of times here, there's a different difference in perspective by some market measures on how fast inflation will come down. We're just going to have to see. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to try to persuade people to have a different forecast, but our forecast is that it will take some time and some patience and that we'll need to keep rates higher for longer, but we'll, we'll see. Go to Brendan for the last question. Hi, Chair Powell. Uh, Brendan Peterson with Punchbowl News. Uh, I wanted to ask if the Fed takes into account at all the debt ceiling when it comes to quantitative tightening, given the fact that rapid or faster quantitative tightening could bring us closer, faster to that drop dead debt ceiling deadline. Could it play an effect as we get closer to that drop dead deadline this summer? I, look, I, it's very hard to think about all the different possible ramifications, and I, I think the answer is basically I don't I don't think there's likely to be any important interaction between the two because I believe Congress will wind up acting, and as it as it will and must in the end to raise the debt ceiling in a way that doesn't risk, you know, the progress we're making against inflation and the economy and the financial sector. I believe that that will happen. I believe it will happen. You know, it, we, we, of course, will monitor money market conditions carefully uh, it, as, you know, as the process moves on. For example, the, the Treasury general account will shrink down and then it will grow back up. And we understand there'll be lots of flows between there and the overnight repo facility and, and reserves. We, we understand all that. We're watching it uh, carefully. We'll just be monitoring it. Thank you very much. That was it, folks. That was a happy Jay Powell, a bullish Jay Powell, a Jay Powell who feels like he's done his job. He's almost achieved his task. Look at that rally on the QQQ here, the NASDAQ, breaking through the $300 resistance line, which is a tough one to come through. Doesn't mean we've quite done that task yet, by the way. They act like magnets, these options, um, resistance and support lines. But yeah, very, very bullish response to that. If you look at uh, S&P as well, similar story, massive, massive spike up there to 4,115. Above 4,100, I put out this morning, you know, the sun shines, everything is wonderful. And um, you would expect markets to 
to look pretty good, right? Uh, and let me show you that. This is what the way the market set up today. Anything above 4,100, you've got lots of lovely bullishness up to 4,200. That's the way the options market set up. So a very, very positive press conference. He didn't really get, you know, the club out. He didn't really hit us over the head. He doesn't seem particularly bothered about this short-term rally we've got going on. He's just like, yeah, whatever. In the you know, long run, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and that's refreshing for the market. Now, quite a lot of the time, the market reverses what we did on the day. Uh, I, I, I find that is the case a lot of the time. So I wouldn't sort of, you know, call all chickens hatched yet and so on. Um, but, you know, we started the market down at one percentage point. We ended up now at one percentage point up. And, um, OK, we're losing a little bit of that, that that rally there. But still, very, very positive for the market. You can't really find much in that other than then he keeps saying, well, the job isn't done yet. We're likely going to get two or more rate hikes coming in March and May, that would be. And um, I am surprised, Andrea. Yes, I am surprised. I thought he might be a little bit concerned by this market rally that we're seeing, and he isn't. He's just like, yeah, whatever. I think we've done a lot. He feels, I think he feels a sense of achievement. I think he kind of feels like I dodged a bullet here because, you know, he caused this inflation, right? He printed 40% extra US dollars in uh, just two years, which no one's ever done before. And that's essentially what caused this massive, massive, massive rally. I'll show it to you. It's a US, uh, sorry, balance sheet. Balance sheet. Here we go. Up blue line is the balance sheet. And it went from, let me move this up a little bit. It moved from down here at 4 trillion all the way up to, nine trillion so you printed basically five trillion dollars of money which is insane right no one's ever done that before absolute insanity and that's what caused this massive rally and now he's undoing it and he's kind of thinking i think i might just have gotten away with it uh so i think that's essentially what his relief is i think the guy is just like i think i might be all right um, and i think that's why he's so, so positive and then he's saying look we have to wait for the data points we don't expect to cut rates this year, which the market does expect them to. But he says, yeah, the market expects it, but they are looking at a different forecast. If the market turns out to be right, we might. So it's very, very bullish. I, I, I don't really see much hawkishness in this, other than, of course, I think we're going to go into recession and earnings recession and, 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 and all of that, So which shouldn't be bullish. And all that money shredding should bring the market down. And maybe he's just thinking, just give it a couple of months and I'll shred a lot more money and you'll see what the market does. I will bring the market down. I don't need to like, you know, shout and scream. Um, new bull market. Or was it bad news? Lozen? No, it was good news. Um, absolutely good news. So markets flying, markets happy. Uh, let me show you the stock screener here, major stocks. You know, the techie side of it up five, six, seven, eight percent, absolutely flying. Uh, Tesla up five percent almost at $181. Palante up four percent. Basically, the prospect of rate cuts potentially this year makes the unprofitable tech, you know, fly. Is there anything down today? Well, snap, yes. Volatility down, very surprising that. Um, Amex down a bit. That's about it, really. GameStop down a bit. That's actually probably positive. Banks pretty much flat. So good set of data, I would say. I'd say a very, very good set of data. And I think um, surprising. I think the market's going to chase it up unless we get a real turnaround. We do sometimes on the following day. So watch out how the market, uh, the, the big papers, Bloomberg and Reuters and so on, report this. But so far, this looks pretty good. Um, Still, I think it's a squeeze. I don't see this real fundamental in the rally, even though Fed has delivered us a little bit of it here today. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to continue to focus more on, on earnings trades. I'm going to continue to focus on trades where I have a, a big, big, big potential return compared to a small risk like this one here, $145 risk. We could make an eight times return on that. If I lose $145, it doesn't really matter. I set up another trade with a similar setup. And we share these trades with you guys on the our newsletter, Trading Floor Whispers, 
Links down below, FelixTransfer.org slash trade if you want to sign up for that. There's a free trial here. There's a seven-day free trial. Uh, it's $87 a month. If you don't sign up for the year, it's 31% off. And um, who writes these? Well, my, my head coach, who's been an investment banker for 20 years, manages millions of dollars for major funds. And of course, we also do these trades. So these are literally trades that we do. Uh, we share them with you. That doesn't mean that's financial advice and you should run out and do them. But if you want to like learn and understand the sort of outlier events like the Tesla trade we did um, earlier, the last one we did uh, made a 550% return in three days, that kind of thing, then sign up at FelixTransor.org slash trade and, and, and see whether you enjoy the content for the next um, you know seven days and, and possibly seven years if you're getting value out of it, which I very much hope you will. So check that out. Uh, SPY is still up one percentage point, so that's definitely good news. If you guys have any questions, ping them into the chat. I will gladly look at answer that. Yevgeny, what earnings are on today after hours? That's a great question. Let me just um, look at US earnings here only. Let's look at the bigger impact, boys. So today is Wednesday. Wednesday, we've got Facebook today. That's massive. Uh, I haven't traded that so far. I wanted to wait out for this. Um, I might set up, set up a trade or two, but there isn't really a lot other than that. And then tomorrow after market is Amazon, Apple, and there was another big one, wasn't there? Tomorrow, Starbucks, that's a big one too. So yeah, big earnings week continues, um, but absolutely Amazon, Apple really, really moving the market here. And Amazon, you know, be interesting to see their take on cloud because Microsoft was a little bit gloomy on that one. Uh, Google as well tomorrow after market. So really, really big tech day tomorrow. So watch out for those ones. A strong Apple will be a, some serious cherry. That would be, Kyle. Yeah, and that would probably be, give us a nice squeeze up. Got Powell's Golden Retriever loves cucumbers. Don't mention cucumbers. Winston's in the room. He's snoozing behind me. Um, right, let me see if any other questions that I missed. And of course, I'll be glad to answer those. When's Meta is today, after market. Um, he didn't talk about a rate hike pause. He's basically saying we're going to get pretty much two more rate hikes, so March and May, but quarter percent each. And then he's saying he doesn't think he's going to cut rates. But if the market is right with its expectations that inflation is going to come down faster than he thinks, then he'd be open to it. So he was very bullish, I must say, for the market, very bullish. Das wird was, says Horizon in German. A good time to jump in. Um, I, I would not time the market on the basis of these things. I would develop a plan where you just invest every week or every month into a bunch of high quality stocks. And, and, and that's the way I would play it uh, rather than sort of trying to time the market particularly. Um, for timing the market, trades, uh, options trades particularly are much, much better suited because you can have a very low risk and a very large potential reward and you can define your risk. So I really wouldn't try to attempt that with stocks. I don't think that's the, that's the smart case to do. Our Caterpillar options trade is uh, looking up quite nicely here. Um, that's going to likely come in at max profit tomorrow. So that's good news or, or, or the day after. We only got two days left on that. So um, I share all those trades with you guys. I do live trading every week, um, live stream them and, and, and share them with you guys in the community. Um, if you um, have a five-figure pile of cash or portfolio that you are interested in investing, um, not necessarily all in options, but just generally speaking, then check out the link down below, felixfriends.org slash coaching. Hop on a call with us. We literally answer all your questions, walk you through it, uh, exactly what we do and how we do it and how I got 126% return on capital employed last year on my options portfolio. And, and you can you can learn from me directly and work with me directly as well. Uh, so Felix Transfer Rock slash coaching is the link down below. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody tuning in. I appreciate you taking the time to learn news firsthand by actually listening to the man himself rather than some sort of a devilish uh, abbreviation by Bloomberg and co. Uh, smash the like button, guys. It means the world to uh, this channel and this community. I appreciate that. I appreciate you tuning in. And I look forward to perhaps having you on the live pre-market tomorrow. If you don't usually tune in on those, we do them every single day. And thanks very much for watching.